Grab your Bibles and turn to the book. Somebody needed to hear that. Grab your Bibles and turn to the book of 2 Timothy. We are working our way near the end of what are called the pastoral epistles. That's a fancy pastoral is pastor. So first is 2 Timothy, a letters written to a pastor to help charge the church. And the next book, if you'll turn your page in your Bible, what's the next book after 2 Timothy? It's called Titus, and he was also a pastor. And that's a book written to a pastoral epistle, right? That's a letter, letters to pastors. And uh, we are getting near the end of uh, what most people believe is the end of Paul's life. This is what appears to be the last book the Apostle Paul wrote. He's in prison and he's finishing up. And uh, sometimes there's a, a whole message in one verse. We're just going to really look at verses 9 through 13. I put the whole passage up there uh, just to kind of give you a recap of the last five or six weeks to kind of sometimes put things in, in context and perspective as you're following that train of thought. Remember, there are no chapters and verses uh, when Paul was writing a letter. And so he says this after we looked at last week, I fought the good fight. I finished the race and I kept the faith and there lays up for me, you know, this crown of righteousness that God has, not just for me, but for all those who love, have loved his appearing. And, and we looked at that last week. For those of us that are looking, preparing ourselves like a lady would going to the prom or going to a whatever she's uh, uh, going to get married, she gets herself ready. One of the ways to know if a person is really saved, it's not whether they prayed a prayer at VBS 25 years ago, is do they live daily preparing for the return of Christ by living a godly life? That's one of the ways to know if a person is, you know, for sure, for real. They're, they're expecting uh, kind of like when you're goofing around and your teacher leaves the classroom and you're in high school and, and, and you're looking at other people's answers and tests. But when you hear that door rattle and the, the teacher's coming back, when you do hear that door rattle, what do you do, student? Oh, like you were at your desk the whole time, right? You're getting ready because you know who's coming. Papa's coming or Mrs. Papa, right? If it's a lady, you're getting ready. When you're living a life, you're living holy and godly, knowing Christ is coming back, you, you live ready because you know you want to be pleasing and holy to the one who loved you and died on the cross for you. We pick up this morning in verses 9 through 13. And here's Paul writing. And who's Paul writing to? Come on, answer that fact. Timothy. This is the book of 2 Timothy. Okay. You're thinking, oh, he's going to try to trick me. No, no trick question. Paul is writing to Pastor Timothy. And so Timothy's not there. I should have put a map to kind of, you know, if you're from Russia and I say you went from Iowa to Kentucky, a Russian would say, you know, where's that, right? So anyway, he's writing a letter to Timothy and he's saying, and this is where we pick up this morning, be diligent. Or did he say, take your time? He says, be diligent to meander around as you go to the Mediterranean cruise line. And if you get here in about the next eight or 10 months, it'd be great. Is that what he said? No, he says, be diligent, Timothy, to what? Come to me quickly. And then he says something there in verse 11. He says, you know, get Mark and, and bring him with you. And he's useful for me, the ministry. Hey, bring this cloak that I left with Carpus uh, at Troas when you come. And don't forget to bring the books and the parchment. Lord, open our eyes. God, even words that seem to be um, not consequential, not applicable to our daily lives in 2024, the United States of America. Father, you don't... Uh, you're not superfluous. You don't just throw words out for nothing. God, words in your word have a meaning that we can, Father, we can dig into this mind to find that diamond. Lord, diamonds don't just sit on top or, or gold. You have to go and you got to chip away with that chisel, Lord, to get to that diamond or get to that ruby or, or gold. And so, Father, you have a word for us today, every one of us. May we listen. Father, may you give us tender ears. Father, help us where we're disappointed or or Father, going through times of grief or sadness, help us where we're angry or bitter at somebody. Help us where we're blind. We think we're so smart, Lord, but we're really blind to what you're trying to do. So would you open our eyes, Lord? Would you touch people watching, people that are not saved? Father, people that have drifted, people, Lord, who are choosing to, Father, just a half step it, Lord. Father, it's hard to worship. You're not standing up in your living room really worshiping, Lord. Not to sit and judge a message, Lord, but let the message judge them. God, that they would find hope to come back to the body of Christ, whether they're saved, Lord, and if they're not, to get saved right there in their living room or in their hospital if they need encouragement. Would you speak to us, Lord? God, would you fill us to overflow that our cup would runneth over? We welcome you, God. Touch our hearts, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, 
Church, I titled the message this morning, Living Well So That You Can Die Well. Living Well So That You Can Die Well. Apostle Paul is near the very end. Don't know if it's days or weeks at this point. And so with that urgency in mind, he says to Timothy, be diligent to what? Does diligent mean kind of meander around? Diligent is what? Let's go. Come on. He doesn't know, hopefully, that Timothy can make it in time to see him. But he does something different. This super apostle, this guy that was sold out to the Lord, is, is he in prison because he's a wicked felon? No. He's in prison for telling people what? The truth. the truth. Hey, God loves you. God died for you. There's only one God, and he loved you enough to die on a... Isn't that wicked, evil stuff? But in many nations in the world, you, you can't do that. One of the missionaries right now that we prayed for, you all know what country he's in. It's 13th in the list in the world of persecuting Christians. You can't witness to anybody of that nationality, which is like 95% of the people. That's many, many nations just simply saying there's a God who loved you and died for you. He was born. He became a man. That's how much Satan is deceiving the nations of the world and individual people that live in our own country. And so he says, be diligent, Timothy. I don't know how much time I got, uh, but would you come to me very quickly? I started, when I read that this week and I started pondering on that, this great apostle, uh, sometimes there's this almost this attitude that if you ask for help, you're wimpy. That kind of was in my mindset growing up. If you ask for help, that's it's a sign of weakness. Strong people, I pull myself up my bootstraps. I'm a self-made man, and, and I don't ask nobody for help. Well, that's where we're going to look at it just for a few minutes as we're breaking down this passage this morning. We often go to either extremes when it comes to uh, asking for help. We either can mooch off people. We can either squander money and then run and ask for somebody to cover for us. We can take advantage of somebody that's got money, a friend or a mom or a dad, and, and we take advantage and we don't do our part. And, and that's not good. That is not a good form of asking. But then we can go to the other end of the pendulum, and that's where we just don't ask. We have a need, it's legitimate, and because Satan says, well, it looked like you can't meet your own needs, and you're weak, and you're wimpy, and so you suffer silently. Maybe your need is a spiritual need. Maybe you're hurting. Maybe you've been abused bad, or you've been really mistreated, and, and you just want someone to help you, and you're embarrassed to ask for help because that'll make it look like you should be strong enough on your own that you don't need any help, and that's the other end of the pendulum. Paul here, as we get started this morning, tells Timothy, be diligent to come to me quickly. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you there's two kinds of times in your life or two types of people, if you'll allow me to say it that way, that you should learn to ask help from. Because Paul is not ashamed to say, Timothy, I want, you to, I want you to be diligent and I also want you to do it quickly. And then he lists different things that he wants. I want you personally. I'd like a cloak. I'd like some books, a parchment, et cetera, et cetera. And get this guy named Mark, come, ask him to come help me. So there's two different types in your outline. Um, here's, the, here's the first thought I want to share with you. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of wisdom and humility. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. Though I used to think that as a, as a young Christian and for many years, it's a sign of weakness. No, it's a sign of wisdom and it's a sign of humility. Let me give you the two types of people, if I can say it that way, that you should learn to uh, ask Help from, look at Matthew chapter 7. You know this, right? Sermon on the Mount, right? This is a really familiar, even if you're not in church very often, you probably know this verse. It says, give us this day our yearly need. Give us what? Just, just what I need for what? Today. Now, I don't know about you, but because I had eight kids, we had to have two refrigerators, right? One in the garage because we would go through over a gallon a day. So I didn't want to go back and forth to Walmart every day. So we had to have another refrigerator. I could, we went through a lot of milk. And so I could almost say, Lord, could you give me my daily, year, my yearly need so I don't have to go back and forth all the time? No, the Lord is teaching us to pray and ask him to what? Give me my what? Give me the things, Lord, I really need. I, I've learned as I grow older and older, God hasn't given me just my daily needs. He's given me a lot of daily wants and other things that I really don't have to have. Right? How many of you have to have ice cream? 
Well, but I have ice cream in our refrigerator. And he, he says, I want you to learn to pray like this. Give us this day our daily bread. And then, and then what else are you supposed to be asking for? So I'm, I'm only supposed to pray that one time because I'm saved. I never have to pray that again. Anybody ever screw up other than me? Anybody ever need God to forgive you past salvation? Okay, good. I'm in the right, I'm in the right place. 90% of you are, are hearing from the Lord. He says, so pray. Hey, God, would you give me the things I need today? Remind me that if you could give me a brain aneurysm right now that I'm going to be, I'm going to be deaf, dumb, and mute, and paraple- uh, whatever, paraplegic, and, and, and I'm not able to work a job. Lord, I don't even think of asking you every day for the strength to be able to get to work, not get in a wreck, uh, not have somebody try to get me fired or my job go out of business, things that we never even think of asking. Yet he says, Lord, give me my daily bread, the things that I really have to have to make it in life. And God, would you remind me, um, forgive me, First of the things I do to others, not what others do to me. Anybody ever hurt you here? Raise your hand. Okay. Anybody here ever hurt somebody else? Oh, good. A lot of times nobody wants to raise their hand on the second one. And so I have to live my life. What you do to me, I can't control. But how I respond to you, I can control. You want to say I'm a this, I'm a that. Hey, you're right, your opinion. I don't have to be bitter and I don't have to have you. You're bitter towards me. You say this and that. Hey, maybe on judgment day, you'll be right. But if you're wrong, I control how I think about you. And I refuse to let Satan to put me in prison here. You know, we, sometimes we get put on Facebook prison here at New Hope. So if I say things that aren't correct, they will put New Hope on Facebook prison. So our sermon is not online if I use certain key words. So I refuse to let Satan put me in his prison here. By causing me not to forgive people. I like to say, bless their little ignorant hearts. That's a Southern saying. Bless your little ignorant heart. Of course, I don't say that to them out loud. (laughs) But Lord, would you forgive me of any debts that I have? Lord, don't lead me to what? Lord, my flesh wants to do a lot of stupid. Do you know when you got saved? I don't know if you know this. When you got saved, your flesh didn't get saved. You know that. You're going to get a new body. This doesn't love Jesus. The spirit is willing that came into you, but your flesh is, oh, my flesh is weak. You give me enough bad opportunities. You let me get burned enough. You tempt me enough. I could do some really stupid things. In fact, my wife says I've done them before. (laughs) So Lord, help me, God. I I think I'm strong, but the moment you think you're strong, you're really weak. So you remind me that whatever is going to come across my path, Lord, I can't overcome it, but you can overcome it in me, Lord. I can do all things through Herbie? No. I can do all things through Christ. That's That's how you get over temptations. Lord, if I allow you to live your life in me, God, I can overcome. But if I don't, Lord, I'm silly putty in the hands of the evil one. This is what he's saying, right? Don't lead me to temptation, but what? Satan's a lot more clever than you apart from the Holy Spirit. He's however many thousands of years old, you don't have a chance. You ever had your a little kid try to be sneaky at your home, four or five, thinks he could hide something from you? Well, you laugh because you're a 30, 40, 50 year old parent. Can you imagine how much older Satan is than you? Apart from the Holy Spirit, you're no match for him. But with the Holy Spirit, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So then he says this, basically, so basically what? We could take passage after passage after passage as we're looking at this. And, and this is what we're trying to say as we're looking at this passage. You need to learn, and it's funny, this is exactly what Pastor Glenn shared at the men's breakfast yesterday morning. One of the ways to really begin to walk with the Lord, especially as you near the end of your life, keep asking God for things. It's not, I, I used to think, I'm just keeping it real here. When both my brothers got saved, they, uh, I remember they came from a prayer meeting and they were talking about these things that they asked God for. Now, it, it, it costs money, right? When they were, whatever the item was. But in my little 16, 17 year old mind, I said this, I was too polite to, I thought this, I was too polite to say it. I, I thought to myself, why are you guys praying to God for that? Just go out and get the money and buy it. Right? That was my natural mind. And I thought, Brothers, quit praying to God. Just go out and pull your money together. And if you have to borrow something, buy it. That's because my natural mind didn't understand spiritual things. 
I didn't understand that there's a God that wants to hear you ask him for things. It's not a sign of being wimpy. It's not a sign of being weak. It's a sign that there is a God that's bigger than me, that's smarter than me, that's richer than me. If I have a need, I can ask him. There is a God that whatever my needs are, he's told me to come to him and ask for my daily needs. First thing I want to say to you as we're looking at this passage I still, I've shared this before, but I, I really prayed a lot before when I was in high school and college. Didn't I tell you the times I used to go surfing? I surfed all over Florida, California, Mexico, uh, just you name it, all over on the Texas coast. I surfed, I would fly and, and surf at places. And I was really a praying guy. I've told you before, whenever I got my surfboard and I was ready to put my toes in, my wa- in the water, you know what I always prayed for? Oh, I, well, yeah, that, oh, I, I should have prayed for waves. I didn't have faith. I prayed that a shark would what? Oh, man, I was a praying guy. Lord, because I remember one time watching Jaws. Y'all remember Jaws? I, it was a midnight showing in Houston, Texas. I saw it, and then we drove down about an hour to the beach at Galveston Freeport to go surfing. And now, you know what's in the back of my mind? Dun, 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 dun. Remember that? I've just watched it, a midnight showing. I should have watched it like eight months before, right, during the winter. And I'm watching it, and we go to the beach. Now, sometimes, if you ever, maybe some of you go fishing out in the ocean, I remember paddling, and every time I'd paddle some, I don't know what they were, little mullet heads, they're little fish on the top of the surface. And every time I was paddling, I would hit a little fish. You ever see a brother jump off a fish, by a surfboard, like about three feet? Whoa, whoa. Every, and out of all the days, there was fish on the top of the surface, and I was paddling, I was hitting one. Because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I was a praying man, but I only prayed for God to spare me. I never prayed for God to use me to witness to my friends or to help me to live a godly life. You understand that? First thing I want to say to you as we're looking at this passage where he says, come to me, Timothy, come quickly, is learn to ask God for help first. You go to God first. As you grow, Paul's not embarrassed to call out to God. In fact, I think, there, I don't know, there's a passage where he says, uh, I don't know if we have a passage and um, we probably don't, but he's saying, hey, uh, pray for me that I would have an open door to be able to witness and share the faith. Paul was always calling out to God. But the second thing I want to say to you is we shouldn't just ask for God and pray to him. Um, look, at, uh, look at Proverbs. I think we have some Proverbs up on the screen. The Bible says where there's no counsel, where you don't go seek counsel, uh, but uh, where there's no counsel is, the people will what? So if there's no godly leadership, but in the multitude, many counselors, there is what? You got to make an important decision. Guess what you should do? Ah, I can hear from God myself. No, the Bible says get a lot of people say, this is what I'm thinking of doing. What do you think? Hey, you're older, you're wiser. What do you think? Uh, without advice, plans will go wrong, but with many advisors, what? Your plans will succeed. Uh, no, we can go forever, just put a, some, a few up there. Uh, the way of a fool is what? The, everybody thinks they're right. I'm right. This, this is the way I'm right. Anybody ever watch like UK or U of L play basketball and you're sitting there saying, what is wrong with that coach? I can't. Anybody done that? Come on, Rachel. Come on, you're in the house of the Lord. The Lord knows. Oh, don't keep your hand down. All of us do that, right? Did you avail or UK ask you to come be their coach? Do you think you're even in the ballpark of Calipari or Mark Pope or, you know what I'm saying? Howard's pretty close, but for the rest of us, right? And, and, and that's how much pride we have. We can't believe they're so dumb as if you and I know more than that coach. Isn't that true? I can't believe that. Well, you get a lot of counsel from different people. You're not going to make stupid decisions, right? You ever, seen a, you ever seen a cobra when something gets near that cobra? What does a cobra do? You ever seen a little scrawny cat and a big dog comes? What does that cat do? <laughs> you want to see it again? Get the tape. I'm not doing it again. <laughs> little scrawny cat, all the hair. But what it's trying to do is trying to impress you, right? You ever see a, a guy and he's got a nice little uh, gut and an attractive girl goes by? What does the guy do? Isn't that true? That's true, isn't it? See, we're trying to impress people. And with pride, what we're trying to do is impress others when there's really a lack of knowledge. 
Here's a second truth that I want to share with you as we're looking at this. Okay, here, let me illustrate it like this. Anybody ever get a flat tire? Do you dial touch with an angel and hope Gabriel or Michael will show up? Do you got Jesus on the hotline? Jesus on the main line. Tell me what you... No, you know what you do? You call AAA. <laughs> so what I'm saying is when you need help, you're angry, you're discouraged, you're bitter, you're lonely, you're, you, you're frustrated with a spouse or a best friend or you're being mistreated or some junky stuff happened to you a year ago or four years ago or maybe you were abused growing up and that wound of being treated like junk and, and you were abused verbally or sexually and, and there's still a wound in a gaping hole and you don't have victory over it. You're struggling with alcohol her drugs or it doesn't matter what it is we could go on and on and on listen sometimes God is saying I put people across your path use them and take advantage and don't act like you're so spiritual that you don't need help Amen. are you catching what I'm saying yes. and all of us are saying yes but if you'll go to every church I'll give you permission to take one Sunday off every Sunday for the next 52 weeks not, not all of you because I'll be preaching to myself <laughs> but go to every church and find out how many people come forward to say I got a need will you pray for me and you know, as well as I do, very few people come forward and say, I got a need. My spouse walked out of me. I'm broken. Man, I'm, I'm doing some stuff on the side that's not godly. So, so what am I saying? You know, I, I'm thinking about, I am, I always say I'm Jesus junk, right? I can't repair nothing. I can't repair electrical stuff, mechanical stuff, wood stuff. I mean, not, I'm just, if you ask me in the Bible how Colossians, that verse relates to Ephesians, I, I can say, okay, let's break this down. If you're asking me how to fix anything, I am Jesus junk. So God sent me a guy about 18 years ago named uh, Rule Hornback. And Rule can, I think, when it said in the beginning, God created, I think it meant to say God and Rule, right? Because, I mean, that guy could fix anything. And I can't fix anything, and I can't afford a uh, $100 or $80 an hour for an air conditioning. And he would come with a guy by the name of Clyde. Clyde's still here. He's on vacation this week. And they, they fixed everything in my house, right? I should, I should deed my house over to them. I am not too ashamed or too embarrassed to say, Clyde, I call him all the time. Can you help me fix this? My car, my plumbing, my da 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 Neither should you. When spiritually something's not right, then you simply say, can you help me? God draws near to the humble and the broken, but the proud Christian he knows from afar. So the second truth then is this, as God leads you, see, he's doing it here. Paul is saying, come to me quick. Yeah, I'm so tough, I'm so strong. I don't need nobody, it's Jesus and I. Listen to me, God is not threatened that you need another human being to help you. God to say, oh, I'm just shocked. Aren't I enough? No. He even said in the book of Genesis when he told Adam, it is not good that man should be alone. left alone. So you know why uh, Eve was called a woman? Because when Adam saw her, he went, whoa, man. And that's it. She was a whoa, man. She was a woman. That's how, <laughs> that's how that name. You like that one? Okay, that's pretty good. He says, it's not good that man should be alone. So he didn't say, I'm enough for you, though he is, we know in that sense. He's saying, I'm going to present and give you somebody suitable, a helper for you. And this is why we need the body of Christ. We need the church, right? We need each other because you're not complete on your own. You got blind spots. You need somebody to point things out and to help you and show you an area that you're blind in. You think you're really smart. But you need somebody to point something out to help you. Many plans, all those verses up there, you'll, you'll succeed if you listen to godly counsel. Here's Roman numeral two then in your outline as we're looking at this passage. Roman numeral two says this, as Paul is talking, he says, be diligent to come to me quickly. And then he says this, for what? This guy by the name of Demas has what? Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and he's what? He's departed for Thessalonica, and then he says Crescens for Galatia, and Titus for where? You ever seen that Walt Disney movie, The 101 Dalmatians? There it is right there. That's, that's the Dalmatia. I want to stop and look at that. He says, Timothy, I need you here. 
Because the guy that used to be with me, a guy that used to be my sidekick, a guy that was going with me, and, and, and when I did mission trips, he was there, and he was helping me, insisting me, and even calls of my name, for Demas has what? What did he tell Paul? He told Paul what? See you. Now, we have to, you can fill in the blanks just as well as I can. Persecution was, you know, oh, you're, you're in the prison visiting Paul. Hey, we're going to follow you when you leave this, and you're probably going to get thrown in jail too. As he's associating with Paul, the cost got too much, the persecution, the, all the stuff that goes with it, your family turning on you, you're part of that, that, that Jesus, God, and all that cult that you're following. And he's saying, I need you, Timothy, because my, my buddy Demas has what? People say, you're not supposed to mention names. There's 19 times, I think, names mentioned in 2 Timothy, 50 three or four times in 1st, 2nd Timothy, and as well as Titus. Most of the time, they're, they're positive, but there's a few times that Paul names... Can you imagine me naming the name of a person here at New Hope? Paul's doing it. He did it before. Phygelus and all these other names we've looked at the last couple of months. Now, I try to be gracious, and I try to say illustration of somebody that's already gone and not use their name, because it's the principle you need to understand, not the gossip who the person was. You're missing it if you focus on that. But the Holy Spirit leads Paul to say, Demas, he used to be with me and encouraged me. And he's not just forsaken me, he's what? He's now enjoying all the comforts of the Mediterranean Sea. Didn't say he denied Jesus was Lord with his words, didn't say that. He's forsaken me. He was right here. I needed him, man. I was, I was discouraged. I need somebody to talk to and, and take this letter to other churches. And Demas, when I needed him most, the guy abandoned me. And he's gone back to have fun in the world. How would you like your name to be listed there to go down in history? And Herbie has forsaken me, having what? Loved this what? Having loved this present world. Demas started out well, but he's not finishing well at all. What does it say in the, is it 1 John 2.15 when it talks about loving the world? What does 1 John 2.15 say? It says, uh, do not love, maybe the next, if there's another slide, if not, I didn't save it. Uh, th there's Demas, he's mentioned twice in scripture. About year 60 to 62, and I don't want to bore you, make this a Bible college you know, class. But he's mentioned two different times, right? The, the verse that we just saw before. So there in about 60, 62, Demas is mentioned in a positive way. In a positive way. But, but now, now he's talking about loving the world. Well, look what it says in 1 John. Remember we went through 1 John last year? Maybe you forgot this verse. Don't love the world or what? Yeah, if you love the things of the world. Now, we got to stop right there because it's easy to misunderstand a verse. What does it mean to love the world? I thought the Bible says, for God so loved the world. So how do we do that? Well, God so loved the world that he loved people that, that, that don't love him. He loves sinners. He loves everybody. And he's trying to redeem them. That's why he sent Christ. So when it's saying that God loves the world, it means he loves the people that he's created, even though they haven't always responded and treated him well. But when it comes to us loving the world, that means we love things and we've made things our God and our idol. Is there anything wrong with the vacation? Well, no. Anything wrong with having a, uh, taking a weekend and, 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 or going on a Friday and going to Thunder over Louisville or going out to eat? And the answer is no. We all need a break. We need recreation. The word recreation is to recreate. We recreate our mind. We rest from the stress of our job or whatever. There's nothing wrong with those things. But what happens is those things become our idols. And something good in our life becomes something God. All of a sudden, we live for fun, for pleasure. Anything wrong with sex between a husband and wife? And the answer is what? No, it's, it, it's, it was a, a created by God to, to express love between a husband and wife. But all of a sudden, that goes past marriage, and it becomes perverted and wrong outside of a husband and wife in the context of marriage. And all of a sudden, things of the world that are okay and needed at times, all of a sudden, anything wrong with uh, watching a ball game, but watching a ball game on Sunday morning from nine o'clock to two o'clock in the afternoon, well, then all of a sudden you put something, okay, watch a ball game to relax. We all like to watch our favorite team, right? Vikings or whoever it is. And all of a sudden that thing that was good becomes God in your life. It becomes an idol. 
Are you tracking with me? And if you love the world and the things of the world, things that are good have a, a time and a place. Those things no longer have a time and a place. They have first place in your life. And they are now the idol that you worship. And he says, for all that's in the world, the lust of the eyes and the pride, and, the, uh, and all of that is not of God the Father, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but the person who what? Who does the will. How do you know if you have faith? You're doing the will of God. Look at the next one quickly for the sake of time. This is what Jesus is saying about the people of Israel. They draw near to me with their what? Oh, they're talking church stuff. They're talking God stuff. Look what else he says. And they honor me with what? Oh, I love Jesus. I'm a Christian. I'm going to sing these songs, right? Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya, right? They're going to sing all these songs but because Jesus is God and he knows. But what? What about the church folks? Their heart is what? I'm not sure Jesus would be asked to speak at a lot of modern churches today because he would say, you're doing the right things. You're saying the right things, but your heart's not. You, you found a church. You picked a church that would have an early morning service because you could get out and have the rest of the day to go shopping in the flea market and take your kids to sporting events. Can you imagine the apostles doing that? John the Baptist and Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul came into your town with Peter. Hey, which church has the early service? I want to attend that so I can take my kid to a soccer game at, at 10 in the morning. Can you imagine? How, I mean, when you think about it, it sounds so ludicrous. You even pick a church based upon that church revolves around me and my life. Are you tracking with me what I'm saying? So this is what he says. You honor me, but your heart really is what? You say what? You want us to hear, but you really aren't with us. And then he gives one more. Not everyone who says to me, what? I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, Jesus. Not everyone's going to heaven, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who what? See that again? He keeps saying, does the will, does people. I have faith. But your faith doesn't translate into action. You don't have faith. You have fooled yourself. You've allowed Satan to fool you, saying, I said a prayer, I joined a church, I got baptized, wonderful. I'm sure Judas did that too, but he wasn't saved. And this is what he says. He who does the will, many, many, not one or two, millions, countless, will say to me on that day, Lord, had, look, these are good charismatic people. We prophesied in your name. We cast out demons. These aren't Baptist folks. <laughs> these aren't Methodist folks. These are people who are really good, hanging around the charismatic stuff. We cast out demons in your name. We did many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to these people on that day, what? I never knew you. You said you knew me. I never lived in your heart. You did all those things for your sake. You did all those things so you could be comfortable and wealthy. And you wanted a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of the world. And my friend, you can't have both. Tell your wife, honey, I want a little bit of you, but a little bit of that lady at work. Let's see how that's going to fly. See how, see how it's going to fly. Get the frying pans out, right? Yeah, see how that's going to Honey, I just want 10% of that lady. I want 90% of you. See what she'll say to you. It's getting quiet in here. Make sure the extracurricular activities at, at, at your school for your kids and all that stuff. Make sure that doesn't become first place in your life. It's okay, to, it's okay to have fun and relax and all that. I like to watch Dallas Cowboys get beat again every week. So you know I'm a glutton for punishment. I mean, how stupid can I be? I, I keep hoping they're going to win a game. Yeah, so you understand. One of these days, the Detroit Lions are good. Yeah, and the Vikings, I hear you. <laughs> so what am I saying then as we're looking at this passage? Satan is subtle. He would prefer to catch you slowly rather than quickly. Listen to me here. He got Demas here. Didn't say he went into worshiping false religions and demons. It doesn't say that. He just left the difficult times of serving Paul by his side, and he went out to have the good life. Satan would probably not prefer to get you all of a sudden hooked on cocaine, drugs, mass pornography, and sleeping with another lady that's not your wife. He's probably not going to... Well, he'll do that, and he does do that. But he'd rather get you slowly on the installment plan. Because if he does it really slowly, it might take you two, three, five, seven years before you realize, wow, how did I get from? When I used to surf all the time, if, if the tides were pretty strong, you would drift pretty quick. 
And so what we would do is we would look at a car that was a really bright yellow. We would try to find, you know, the, where the lifeguards are, their stand. We would try to find something so that as we were surfing, if we drifted a couple of blocks away, we would know, start paddling the other way. When it's a very slow current, you could drift, and it might take you 30, 45 minutes. When it was a strong current, in like 30, 45 seconds, you're all of a sudden 50 feet down. Satan would prefer to get you very slowly. Because it might take you years and years to figure it out. And by that time, that stronghold has got you strong and you're hooked on whatever that is and you can't get out. Number two in your outline then, as we're looking at this passage, it's whatever it says up there. (laughs) Number two is allow Christ in you to what? Allow Christ in you to change what? See, Apostle Paul and Demas were faced with the same choices. Paul never allowed the world to change him. Paul is changing the world in prison. Can you imagine? Think of one of the most common names in the last 2,000 years. I've got eight kids, four boys. Two of my boys are named Paul, John Paul. John Paul, and then I have my oldest son, Elijah John Paul. I I admired John the Baptist, and I admired Apostle Paul. That's how much of influence that Paul had on the world, even though he's in prison. But how many people name, mamas, name your kid Demas? See, the world came into Demas, and he never changed the world for Christ's sake. Paul had the Holy Spirit in him because of that. He helped change the world. Here's the third truth I want to share with you as we're looking at this passage. Hey, Demas has forsaken me. Oh, and the rest of that verse, the other ones were believers. When he said, this guy went over here and Titus went over there, he just threw them in the same sentence. In other words, I've sent them off. There's ministry to do. I sent this guy to Nashville and I sent this guy to Cincinnati. He's just naming different guys. But Demas, man, he used to be with me and he went back to the world, said, no, thank you. And anybody that has the love of the world in them does not have the love of the Father. How sad. Let's keep moving. Go to, go to Roman numeral th- 3. And look what he says here. He says, be diligent to come to me quickly. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed to Thessalonica. Right? The book of Thessalonians. Crescens went for Galatia. The book of Galatians. Titus went to the 101 Dalmatians. and Walt Disney. Just kidding. Verse 11. And then he says, only Luke is what? Luke was the physician, right? The book of Matthew, Mark, Luke. This is the same Luke. Only Luke is with me. And then he says something, if you don't really, and a lot of people won't catch this, but if we have to take some time to to, to dig into this because it'll make you appreciate this. Get Mark and bring him with you for he is what? Useful to me for the ministry. Why did he throw that Mark guy in? He said, only guy here with me in the prison is Luke. Right? Demas took off. I needed him. Timothy, I need you here. Luke's right here by my side right here. He's helping me and he's taking notes as I'm writing stuff, final thoughts down to different churches. And then he says, would you get Mark and bring him with you for he's useful for the ministry. So what is that he's useful for the ministry? That means you have to go to Acts 15. I think we have it on the screen. If not, go to your Bible, look at Acts chapter 15. This will help you to understand who this Mark guy is. Paul was on an opening missionary journey there, and he's with a guy by the name of Barnabas. Barnabas was an encourager. So Paul takes this guy by the name of Barnabas with him, and they're on a missionary journey. And uh, there in about verse 36, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and let's see how they are doing. So he said, hey, let's follow up at New Hope, and let's go over down here to Owensboro. Let's go to these different churches that we started you know, a year, six, two years ago, and let's see how they're doing. And so look what happens in verse 37. Now Barnabas was what? Determined to take with him who? John called Mark, John Mark. Okay, read this, take your time with this. Barnabas said, we're taking John Mark and Paul the apostle, but Paul insisted what? They should not take him. Why? He had what? Departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. So Paul says, no, Barnabas, he failed us. He left us. He got afraid. He's not mature enough. And so he's not coming with us on this journey. 
Now, Paul's the apostle, but Barnabas is insisting. No, I say, we take John Mark. And Paul the apostle says, no, no, that's not what the Lord's telling me to do. And look what happened. Barnabas kept pushing it. Verse 39, then the contention became so what? Sharp. Paul wouldn't budge. and said, no, I, I am not sensing in my heart that we're supposed to bring that guy. He is not faithful. He deserted us. He's not mature enough. He will back out. He will all that stuff. And Barnabas said, no, 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 we're taking him. It became so sharp that what did they do? They, they left. Barnabas said, well, that's too bad. I'm going to get somebody to help me. And look what it says in verse 39. And so Barnabas took who? This guy named Mark, and he sailed to Cyprus. And then Paul chose Silas, being commended by the bread and by the grace of God. Very interesting. Let me throw you some quick side notes. After Acts 15, Barnabas chose to say, no, Paul, uh, we need to bring this guy. Uh, you hardly ever hear the name anymore, Barnabas. God used him, but had he stuck with Paul? <laughs> he wouldn't listen to Paul. Now, why would Barnabas choose this guy named Mark, called John Mark? Anybody know any kind of tie-in between Barnabas and Mark? If you really know your scripture, you read? They were what? They were cousins. And you know what sometimes a person can do when it's family? They're what? They're blind. And Paul's not family. Even if he was, Paul walked with the Lord that he was going to let those things sway him. No, the guy's not faithful, and the Spirit of God's saying no. And Barnabas, that's my brother, that's my cousin. And so, so they split, and they go opposite ways. That was about somewhere, I don't know, in the early 60s. This book now, maybe 67, five, six, seven years have passed. Paul's in prison, and he must have heard some good reports lately. Like, that's what we do. If somebody said, Herb, you remember my brother he used to come here? He's now in Denver, Colorado with his wife, and he's involved in the ministry. You remember so-and-so left here? Man, they got on fire at their church. And someone told me that about New Hope many, many years ago. And they caught on fire. They're, they're now pastoring. You know how excited I was when I heard that? Man, they caught on fire. They're now a pastor. So they talk, and somebody must have come and told Paul, hey, you know what, Mark? Dude's faithful now. He's back and he's serving and he's taking a stand and he's not chickening out and he's taking a stand. And Paul gets word of that and then he tells Timothy, hey, when you come, guess what? Bring Mark with you. This is an important point for you to understand. Some of you have been hurt by somebody. Some of you have been disappointed by somebody. Somebody in your past. And sometimes what you're, you're doing is you're putting up a, a wall. And you're saying, they hurt me. And listen, if you can hear what I'm saying. Listen very clearly. In some cases, that person God might want to use in your life. And you're saying, no. God is saying, they've changed. They're not who they are anymore. Quit putting out a, a hand. There's a, a, a famous church there in Europe. I need to find the name of the church. Decades ago, when they were meeting under a tree in a, in a place where you can't really get land and it's too hard to get land to, to, to purchase, to buy a church building, they began meeting under a tree. A bunch of them started coming, a whole bunch of people. And the people there in that little town did not want Jesus. They wanted their false religion and that's all. And they began to throw rocks at them. They began to throw bricks at them. They began to throw stones at them week after week when they would meet on Sunday. And this is wild. They threw so many rocks and sticks that they began to build footers. And guess what the foundation of that church became? All the rocks and the sticks and the bricks that were thrown at them. God is going to try to use, and sometimes you'll be at a standstill. He is not going to move you any past allowing a person to come into your life that you put your hand up and say they can't minister to me because you got anger or resentment or you got whatever you got. And God's saying, I'm trying to send somebody to you, but you won't let them minister to you. Do you understand that the Apostle Paul really hurt the church before he got saved? He helped kill Stephen and others in the, in the Bible. And when God sent Paul to the church, you know what they first did? Whoa! You're sending us Osama bin Laden. He's acting like a Christian. He's going to get in our group. And then it took him a while to trust him. Had they not trusted the Apostle Paul and he became a leader of a false religion? 
You know how much damage he'd have done to the church? Number three in your outline then, as we're looking at this passage, God may still want to use you to help others who have hurt you. You might have to admit, I'm not going to help them anymore. Look what they've done to me. Can I say this? Look what you've done to God. You helped murder. That's too strong of a word. God, Jesus laid down his life. You helped kill his son. That's what you've done to Christ. And what did he do for you? He died for you. God's going to bring some people across your path that you don't want to minister to. But God is saying you'll never go any further until you reach out and touch a person that has hurt you just like you hurt him. And he reached out to you. Number three in your outline is that. And he tells you how to treat people that have misused you. Look at Luke. But I say to you what? Dude, we can't even love our own spouses. We can't even love our own parents. <laughs> Love your enemies. You know, how, you know how the church would look if we loved our enemies? It'd be a, it would be the most... I've seen a lot of you. You love people that have hurt you. You've come and talked to me. And you have a beautiful attitude. If that, if that permeated across the whole body of Christ, love people who are your enemies. What does it say else? Be good to what? Do they hate you? What does it mean to be good to them? It means you do what? Do something for them. Take a cake, right? Don't put razor blades in it. Just kidding, 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 right? Take a real good cake. Do something for them, right? Bless them if they want. If they speak bad about you, say something good about you. Whatever it might be good. They don't have that big of a nose, right? Or not many boogers come out of their nose. I don't know. Find something. It says bless them. Bless them if they curse you. Pray for them if they want. Anybody other than me, man, when somebody's really put a dagger in your back, you just... God, mm, you ever, and you, every time you go, try to go to another thought, you just keep going back to that. Am I the only one here? No. Raise your hand. Three of us are going to heaven. Oh, yes. Yay, I see that hand. Man, you can't shake that, can you? Yes. Well, I'm going to say, oh, Lord, help me to worship and help me to pray. Yeah. I always pray, Lord, help. When those things, thoughts happen, I start saying, Lord, help my, my wife become godly. You want to know why Joanne's godly? Because I have to pray a lot of times when those things come to my mind. And then he says this. Okay, just for the sake of time. Uh, and to him who strikes you on the one cheek, turn the other also. From a person who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. So that, that's number three. And God may want you to use you to help others who have hurt you. And here's the last one this morning. And then he says this. Look at the last verse. Uh, wherever it's at. Come on up. Here we go. Okay. Um, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me. He loved this present world. He left me, and when I needed it the most, he went to the church in Thessalonica, that area. Crescens went for Galatia, Titus or Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Hey, bring Mark. Man, he's ready. I'm, re I'm going to use him. I'm not going to say, man, you dirty dog, you abandoned me. You left me while I was in prison, and you took off. You didn't bail me out. What's wrong with you? You denied knowing Jesus so you wouldn't get arrested. No, no, he said, come on, he's useful. Bring him back. I've heard good reports. He can be trusted. Come on. And then he says this, and, and then he says, Tychicus, I've sent to Ephesus, the book of Ephesians. And then verse 13, bring the what? Bring the cloak that I left with this guy by the name of Carpus at Troas. I know a lot of names and, and cities, but catch the point. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. Just think about that. He's in a prison. It's probably turning winter, and he's cold. And I would have said, go down to, go down to Goodwill. But obviously, those items are hard to find. That he said, man, I left a coat back in that other city. When you come, can you stop by? You think it was diamond encrusted because he got because he was a famous TV evangelist and he could sell it for a hundred thousand higher the hammer? What's that attorney out of Louisville? The hammer! If you get him, you're gonna get off every case. You, you think that's why he wanted that that cloak? No, you know why he wanted it? It was getting cold, man. Doesn't sound like a very wealthy prosperity preacher to me, does it? He said, I'm I'm cold. It's getting colder. Could you quickly go get that when you're he's on his way here in the next few days? Could you give me that cloak? Man, I'm, I'm cold. But then he says the last two things, and we'll start wrapping it up here. He says, and bring the what? The books, especially the what? What's that? Well, we can surmise, but he's saying, perhaps bring those godly commentaries on the book of Ezekiel and Genesis, but don't just bring good books on the commentary on the Bible, but bring also what? The word itself. You bring those, those parchments, papyra. That, you bring that, that, that kind of material that they would write and use as paper 
And this is what's wild. Here's Paul at the end of his life. He's not saying I'm going to see Jesus in the next three or five or seven or two uh, days, two weeks. He's saying, don't bring me the sports page. I want to see how UK or UofL did. Didn't say, don't bring me the stock market. I don't care about my por portfolio. You think he had a big IRA, 401k ready, ready, waiting for him? He didn't say, give me all the stats and figures and how much. The, is it S&P? Is that what it's S&P? Is that like Dow Jones, whatever? He, he didn't ask for none of that. He didn't ask for uh, Harlequin books, right? You ladies, those novels. He said, in my last days, I want to eat the breakfast of champions. Bring me the word. Hmm. <laughs> Bring it. If there's anything I need right now, I need to know God's truth. I need to be strengthened. I need to be a better witness to this Roman soldier that I'm chained to. Would you bring me that word? Because above all those things, I want to keep reveling. I, I want to keep relishing this love of God. I, I, can't, I can't fathom a love that would love me when I was helping persecute Christians and even seeing them killed. That that God would have mercy and spare me and then use me to reach other people. I want to keep knowing about this Jesus guy as much as I can so that I can die well because I'm living well. And this is what he says. Would you bring that to me? so that I can spend my final days still digging in deeper into, into the truth and the greatness of God's love, the greatness of God's truth, the greatness of God's mercy. I want to dig in deeper and deeper and deeper. And at the end of his life, this is what he is saying. I want to focus on those things that are the most important things to me. You ever heard the phrase, he's so heavenly minded, he's no you ever heard people say that? Stop right there for a second. You probably never thought about this. I'm a preacher, so that's what I do. I sit around and, and contemplate the deep things of God. He's so heavenly good, uh, heavenly minded, he's no what? Stop. How many people, normally that's said by a person that's so earthly good, they're not really much heavenly good. That's normally said by a person that's not fully committed, that's looking at a person that's really committed. Oh, you're just so heavenly minded, you're not any earthly good. You know what I've noticed over the, the four decades I've been a believer? I've noticed that the people who are the most heavenly minded are normally always the most earthly good. Example, John the Baptist was pretty heavenly minded and he was a lot of earthly good. The apostle Paul right here, this dude was nothing but Jesus and he sure was a lot of earthly good. How about Jesus? Do we have a scripture verse for Jesus? Uh, tell me if we got one for Jesus. Abracadabra, hope I got it up there. Jesus and Matthew, Luke, open sesame, come back. It's not coming back. I sent the wrong one. Okay, you can, uh, it came up there. Okay, you can, uh, uh, I'm probably going to backtrack here a little bit. If, if, Luke, if you can find Luke 24, yeah, look at Luke 24. Let's look at this one and we'll start wrapping it up. It's, you know the story. Jesus is, uh, his parents are having the festival and they all leave. And guess, as they're looking at the caravan, guess who they forgot? Hey, wait a minute. David, you get, no, no. Rick, did you, hey, wait a minute. Did you, and they're all, who got, I didn't bring him. No, it was you. No, I know it was me. And you're going to car to car. We're saying, no, I thought you, he was talking with your kid and he was talking with cousin so-and-so. And they find out Jesus is not there. And what do they do? They go back and they walk into the temple and Jesus was playing cubic, cubic rubes or whatever, and he was doing uh, video games. And that's what Jesus was doing, right? And they asked him, Jesus, what are you doing? And he said, didn't you know? As a 12-year-old kid or so, he looks at mom and dad and said, didn't you know that I had to be about my... As a, as a little 11, 12-year-old kid. Now, in our culture... Somebody studies all the time to get a scholarship, and they study after class Friday, Saturdays at the library. They study four, five, six hours on a, on a Friday night and Saturday. Oh, man, how ambitious. A kid practices for whatever his sport is, baseball, basketball, football, whatever, volleyball. And, man, they practice, and they're the first to the gym. They're the last. They give all their free time. They don't even go to church, or if they do, it's just to slip in and out. And we say, wow, he's dedicated. 
But a 12, 14, 15 year old kid goes to church Sunday school, Sunday morning worship on Wednesday night or uh, goes to a, a youth activity. And you know what? Sometimes a parent will say, man, he's getting carried away with this religious stuff. Oh, it's perfectly fine to chase after the world and we applaud it, but they get serious about God and we say, you're taking this religion too far. My friend, you can't take it far enough. So the last truth that I want to share with you, sorry, folks, I, I think it's Roman numeral three. That's why I jumped around a little bit and I threw them off. Here's the truth of the matter. You don't have much longer to live. You say, Herb, I might live 20, 30 years, but it's going to go by like this. Ask those of us that got a few decades on us. I still remember my high school reunion, my, my, my graduation. I was, let's see, that was 10 years ago for me. All right, all right, 15, 15. Okay, I'm close. <laughs> it's going to go like this, friend. I was in my 20s, my teens back then. It's going to go like this. Make your last days count. Go out with glory. Finish well. You can only die well if you're living well. Look at what's really... I'm not saying don't have fun. I'm not saying don't go to the beach and don't go to a lake. I'm not saying don't go fishing. and Have fun. Go to a bar. I'm not saying don't do those things, okay? Don't, don't mishear me. But keep it in its perspective. Keep God first. I don't need a vacation from God. <laughs> I might need it away from my job. But God is not competing with entertainment and leisure in your life. Cash it in. Use every day for the glory of God. You don't have much longer to live. Give it all to God while you can. Look at some of the things. Am I putting too much emphasis and fun on something that's leisure and pleasure? I'm not saying don't watch a TV at home. I'm not saying those things. There's a time and a place for everything. But you hear what I'm saying. Make it that your love for God is so obvious that those things don't control you.